So now I would like to introduce, introduce Howard White of the Campbell Collaboration, an organisation dedicated to evidence synthesis and systematic reviews for evidence-informed policy and practice. Previously, Howard was the founding executive director of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation and led the Impact Eva Evaluation Programme of the World Bank's Independent Evaluation Group. Uh, we're very lucky to have Howard. He's in Melbourne for the Global Evaluation and Implementation Conference, which just finished yesterday. So we're very pleased he was prepared to give one more presentation <laughs> after such a huge event. Howard will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and discussion. Thanks and please welcome Howard. Well, thank you, Jane, for the kind invitation. Um, welcome. Good morning to you all. Um, inspired by your, um, your uh, um, the video, I'm going to start with a, a short story. <laughs> so my background is in international development, and I decided to do that at, at quite an early age, by so high school. And <coughs> my plan when I went to university and did development studies was to then go and work in development projects and do good deeds. And in the first year, I decided actually no. I want to work on, on policy, because if you work on a specific project, you might affect 100 lives or so. If you affect policy, you can affect thousands, tens of thousands, millions of lives. And when I told my father about this, I'm going to on that one and do, I'm going to do research actually on, on policy, effective policy, he said, I'm surprised you want to study poor people rather than actually help them. <laughs> so, I thought he'd wrong about that then, and I still think he's wrong about that. I think doing effective research in forms policy actually is the most good you can do. And there's been, in the last uh, 30, uh, 30 years now, an evidence revolution that really has transformed the value of research and policy. And what I'm going to talk about is that evidence revolution, which I've been quite closely involved with in the development space. And it's really made a difference. But I know when I started as an academic back in the 1990s, the advice I gave to governments based on research really was very much informed by my own values and opinion. Whereas today, we've got mechanisms for transferring research evidence to government, which is far more rigorous. And the evidence revolution is about getting that rigorous evidence to inform policy. So here we go. Um, I do encourage you to use social media. Um, Twitter handles here for Campbell and myself, and also use the hashtag for the event. And if you're, you want to get lots of followers, the way to do that is to use the hashtag and they'll spot you where they search on it and they'll retweet you and start following you. So if events like this, a good time to get lots of new followers on your social media accounts. Um, so the evidence revolution. There have been four waves of the evidence revolution over the last 30 years. So the first one, was the new public management agenda, or the results agenda, which started in the US and the UK in particular, but also actually here in Australia and New Zealand. It's an anglophone phenomenon, uh, particularly in the uh, Clinton government, the government Results Reforms Act in 1993, the Modernising Government Paper in 1999 in the UK. And the important thing about the results agenda was it shifted the way we measure performance from inputs to outcomes, from just how much money we've spent to things like poverty, unemployment, homelessness, uh, child, child abuse and so on. And so that was a really important achievement. So we, it really was the case in the 1980s, I was working in a planning office in Africa in the 80s, we just, well, have we spent the money or not? Instead now we're focusing very much on these longer run outcomes. For anyone who's in international development space, that was the Lending Development Goals and the British International Development Targets and now the sustainable development goals, are the manifestation of the results agenda. And that was a good thing, turning the focus from measuring performance by inputs to outcomes, but it had its shortcomings. Let's see what those shortcomings were. So here we are, the same example from the UK, and this is from Modernising Government's uh, white paper, and they want to ensure effective services, make sure the services improve people's lives, that's what we mean. 
and they're going to do that through what they call public service agreements. So every government agency had to have a public service agreement with the Treasury. So here's an example that my background is capital development. My examples come from that sector, to a large extent, or experience around the world. So the, the um, former stocks of DFID, which is the UK equivalent of what was AID and now VFAT here in Australia, were based on, oops, sorry, um, based on the 30 large recipients of British aid having certain never increasing economic growth, under five maternal mortality being reduced, and more children going to school. And so they're measuring performance of British aid programs by these outcome indicators in the top 30 top recipients of British aid. This is the performance targets from 1999 to 2000. So let's go back a few years. Remember I mentioned already, in 1993, you had the Government Results Performance Act in the US, requiring every government agency to have a results framework. And so the USID, the US Development Program, they had six strategic development goals, things like broad-based economic growth, and for each goal, they defined outcome indicators at both country and global levels. For example, average annual growth rates. Very similar to what the UK government had uh, six years later. So in the performance report for 2000, for example, they said, well, in the second half of the 90s, 70% of uh, USAID assisted countries were growing at uh, positive growth rates compared to less than half in the first part of the decade. So growth rates have increased in the recipients of US foreign assistance. That's how we say we've got a good performance on economic growth. But there's a bit of small print, and the small print says you can't reasonably attribute overall country progress to our programmes. So these are our results, but they, they're not, we're actually responsible for them. So the General Accounting Office of the US was responsible for monitoring these outcome frameworks, and they wrote a letter back to USID in 2000 saying, your indicators are so broad and progress affected by many factors other than US programmes, these indicators cannot reasonably serve as measured your agency's performance. In other words, your results framework doesn't actually tell us about your results. And what happened was the USID uh, abandoned the use of these indicators in 2000. They abandoned them. Around the time all our countries around the world were adopting them, the USID, I wrote a paper this time called The Road to Nowhere, saying USID has been down this road, doesn't go anywhere, don't go there. Wasn't very influential, because <laughs> lots of countries then went down that road. Um, so this doesn't mean we shouldn't do policy monitoring. It is, the outcomes are important, but you need to know the limitations of what outcomes can tell you. And there are many countries that do use outcome data for good purposes, and I'm going to mention a couple of examples. And I'm sure it's, there are many examples you know from here in Australia and your own work. So in India, for example, 27% of girls are married before they're 18. The median age of marriage in many areas is 14. So girls getting married very young. Early marriage is a bad thing. Girls married early have far less agency in the relationship. They typically marry men who are so 20 years older than them, if not 30 years older than them. Um, and they, the children born to young mothers are more likely to suffer malnutrition, more likely to suffer early death. So it's a bad thing. If, 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 if early marriage was 2%, it would still be a bad thing, but okay, it's not really bad. But it's over a quarter of women are getting married before they're 18. So it's a big problem. And so we can use data like this for advocacy purposes. This is a problem. You do something about it. If we have data on how it's distributed geographically or by ethnic group or uh, 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 so on, by levels of education and so on, then we can use that information to target our programs, design our strategies to target that particular problem. But knowing that 27% of girls married before they're 18 doesn't tell us what to do about the problem. It just tells us there is a problem. Similarly, um, so such data is useful for advocacy, strategy, program targeting. Similarly, there's an NGO in India called Pratam, and they publish an annual status of education report, the ASA. And this comes out each year, and it's watched very closely by, government, uh, by local government officials, because it publishes for each district education data on not just enrolments, but also on learning achievements. And there's a big crisis in learning outcomes across the developing world. And so in India, for example, of uh, five out of ten standard five students, year five students, can read at a standard two level. So not five out of ten can read at a year five level at year five. Five out of ten at year five can read at a year two level. Okay, so really bad levels of learning for reading. It's worse when it comes to math 
only two out of ten at standard five can solve a simple three-digit sum like 405 divided by five. Only two out of ten can do this sum at standard five. Five is a score length, only two out of ten can do this. So there's a huge problem in learning. Again, doesn't tell you what to do about it, just tells you there's a big problem here. Similarly, in Uganda, they have an annual government, annual performance report, has lots of monitoring indicators. So, for example, here's vitamin A dosage for under fives. They had a target of 66%. Uh, in baseline year, it was 27% only. And at the end of the year, it hardly moved. So, whatever they were doing to try and uh, increase vitamin A coverage doesn't be working. We need to do more effective programs to increase vitamin A coverage. So, performance monitoring tells you what the problem is doesn't tell you what to do about it. So how are you going to do it? And that was, that was wave one of the Evans Revolution, was results agenda. Focus on outcomes, they're what matter, that's, what we're, that's why we do what we do, is to improve outcomes, to improve lives. But just knowing this problem doesn't tell us what to do, how do we know what to do? We learn what to do by having rigorous impact evaluations, preferably randomised controlled trials, where you have random assignment of program with treatment and control groups. And there's been a huge rise. This is the second wave of the Evans Revolution. First wave was the results agenda in the 90s. Second wave since the early 2000s is the rise in particular randomized controlled trials. So if we look at international development, impact evaluations. This is a database of my previous organization, 3IE. We see from the early 2000s, you start to see a massive rise in RCTs. So around 40 a year in the 2000s, and by 2012, at over 500 a year. Over 500 a year being published, compared to less than 40 a year in the 2000s. So this is the second wave of the entry revolution going on here. It's the same in developed countries. So this is publications of social, wealth, social work RCTs, and you see the same rise from the early 2000s, increasing publications per year. So this is a worldwide revolution of the rise of impact evaluation, including randomized controlled trials. There's So. The, the problem is that we've got this, this growth of single studies and we want to learn from them, but there are many of them and you shouldn't just use one single study to inform your policy decisions. I'm going to give three examples of why, where that would have been a bad idea. The first one actually links to um, something you mentioned, which is domestic abuse. And so these are mandatory arrest programs. Uh, and there was a, so that means that when police are sent to a scene of domestic abuse, they have to arrest the suspected perpetrator, usually the man, of course. And so in 1984, there was a randomized controlled trial of mandatory arrest in Annapolis, in the US. And so police sent to a scene of domestic abuse had a randomization tool, and they had to either arrest the perpetrator or give counseling to the couple or remove, temporarily remove the suspect from the scene rather than the rest of them. And what the trial showed was that reoffending, repeated cases of abuse, were only 13%, 1%, 3%, with mandatory stress, double that, 26%, with the next most effective treatment. This is a widely publicized trial, it's in the New York Times, the authors on television, all that stuff, and by 2000, 75% of police districts had mandatory stress programs. So you might think, well, that's great, there's an RCT, it shows work, it gets adopted. Not so great, because there are five further RCTs in five other cities, none of which replicated the result. Two of them found mandatory arrest was worse than the alternatives, and the other three found it was the same. So just one case wasn't enough to prove the evidence base. The author of the original study said he didn't think they should have gone to scale based on one study. You need more evidence. You need to test out in different contexts, different settings. You might have just got a freak result. You need to build up a body of evidence to inform policy from a single study. Second example, nurse-family partnership, getting a bit closer to home. Okay, so nurse-family partnership, many of you are probably familiar with it, is a home visitation program for mothers with disadvantaged backgrounds to give advice on how to raise a child. There are other elements, that's the core of it. There have been three studies, RCTs, of nurse-family partnership, one in uh, New York in the 70s, one in Tennessee in the 80s, one in, Denver, in Colorado in the 90s, all showing the program's effective all carried out by the programme designers, this is a branded programme, <laughs> these are carried out by the designers, there's a conflict of interest issue I'm not going to go into, but Canberra reviews do show independent evaluations find less effects than non-independent evaluations. Uh, but the interesting thing is this web page, cited as US evidence, is the Australian Nurse Family Partnership. So they're saying, here we know the programme works, here's all this US evidence. 
What they don't cite here is the Dutch trial of NFP or the English trial of NFP, as far as the Lancet, which there are no effects for nurse family partnership. And why is that? Well, a very plausible explanation, which is not just mine, other people have said it too, is the difference in context. So if you're a young mother with disadvantage uh, background, in a randomized controlled trial, some people get the treatment, the nurse family partnership, and some get usual services. And if you're in the US, from this one background, usual services for advice to pick up a child are, are zilch. There aren't any usual services, there are nothing. So the treatment's given you something you would otherwise get. But in England, I'm English, as you can probably tell, in England we have the National Health Service, which provides free antenatal care, which advises you how to pick up your child. You have free hospital delivery, and you're sent home with a birthing package. And then once you take the child home, you get a health visitor visits you once a week to advise you how to bring up your child. That is nurse family partnership. So the control group get the same as the programme. So adding the programme onto that home visitation programme of health visitors won't have any effect, because they're already getting that through the National Health Service. Usual services provide the same as the programme. So context matters. You can't take a study from one context and say it will definitely work in another context. Evidence-based policy is not a blueprint approach. If you want to tweet stuff, you can tweet that. Evidence-based policy <laughs> is not a blueprint approach. Okay? It's, it's about learning from what's worked elsewhere and saying, well, let's try it and test it here. Not just, okay, it worked in many Minneapolis, it worked in Melbourne. You can't say that because context is different. Final case in the international development one is deworming. So there's a very well-known study of school-based deworming programs in Western Kenya that has fueled this deworm the world movement. When Kenyan government went to scale with school-based deworming, many states in India have adopted school-based deworming, pushed by this deworm the world movement. And you go to the web page for the deworming program in the state of Bihar, for example, in India, you'll read on that website that the global evidence shows that school-based deworming has substantial benefits on child health, nutrition, education outcomes. The global evidence shows. That statement is simply untrue. There are 65 studies of deworming, three of which show such benefits, the other 62 of which show no such benefits. There are 12 studies from India itself showing no such benefits. So it's very surprising that the Indian governments and or states in India would adopt school based deworming programs as a national deworming day in India as a whole, based on a study from Kenya when the Indian government actually says this program is not effective in this way. And so a single study has been used to promote a programme as the best fine development, when actually the global evidence shows very clearly that really is not the case. And this is a very good example, because people say, why are you against deworming? It's very cheap intervention, it's, it's, it gets rid of the worms, which it does, so surely you have to do it. We have to make a choice for how we use our resources. And it's not the best fine development, because big kids, basically kids get worms again. You have to attack the sanitation environment if you're really going to sustain induction in, in worm burden, health nutrition and education benefits from that. Um, and so you have to decide where you're going to spend your money. So I'm precisely, it's not that I don't care about child health, I say deworming is not the best buy, because I do care. And we want the evidence to be used on programs that are the most effective programs. So we need to look across the evidence base to see what they are. So we need to look across the evidence base, which brings us to wave three of the evidence revolution, which is the rise of rigorous evidence synthesis. So for all this evidence, we need to summarise it in what is systematic reviews, preferably Campbell systematic reviews. So there's been a huge rise in evidence synthesis across both developed developing worlds. So this is a rough estimate based on, on education reviews, based on a quick Google Scholar search, and an ERIC education database maintained by the Institute of Education Sciences in the US. And the third wave is coming in the last decade. So you see since 2008, you see this rise in reviews being done in education from you know, 10, 20 a year up to well over 100 a year. And you see the same thing in international development. You go back 10 years, there are virtually no reviews being done. What was being done was open health. And now by 2016, over 100 reviews published a year. A lot of actually was financed by the Australian government. And so there's been a huge rise in its systematic reviews across both the developed and developing world. So this is the third wave of the evidence revolution, doing reviews to summarise positive evidence. This is, this is great, okay? So here we are, third wave. The, the, this matters, let's talk about why this matters. So we go to a, another example that you gave about what we eat. So this is a story from the BBC back in 2014. The UK government recommends that people eat 
five pieces of fresh fruit and vegetables a day. A study came out saying actually you have to eat seven or more. Five is not enough. You need to eat seven or more to get the health benefits. BBC story, seven or more, you want to have health benefits, looks impressive. A few months later, BBC came out with another story which said more than five a day has no effect. <laughs> okay? Now, this doesn't help people who are proponents of evidence-based anything because the evidence seems contradictory. Drink red wine, don't drink warm wine, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you. Okay, so if the evidence seems conflicting, what you're going to do, you're going to ignore the evidence. So when you have conflicting evidence like this, and it's not like, oh, it's a different research question, it's the same research question. How many pieces of fresh fruit should we eat each day? So one has to be right, one has to be wrong. There's no, I mean, it's not like strong or weak evidence. There's, there's right and wrong here, and it's a very strong term to say that research is wrong, but one has to be wrong. So let's look at the studies. This is the, um, the seven-piece study, and it's published in a peer-reviewed journal. So one thing you learn is being published in a peer-reviewed journal is not necessarily a mark of quality, because one of these, they're both published in peer-reviewed journals. They have a graph, so it's very scientific. And what's that graph show? On the horizontal axis is people, a uh, number of fruit and uh, vegetables eaten each day, from zero, so people that eat every meal at Hungry Jacks or something and never see a piece of fresh fruit in their lives. And up to, that's not fair, they do vegan burgers, they're, they're cool. Um, up, to, up to more than seven. And, um, and you see, so there's this graph on the hot vertical axis is percent decrease. Percent decrease in what? Percent increase in risk of death. So this is quite an important outcome, okay, <laughs> in health terms. Okay? So you're 42% less likely to die right now if you've eaten your seven pieces of fruit and vegetables per day. Yes? If less than that, good luck to you. <laughs> right? So, so this seems like, okay, I'm going to do that. What's the problem in this paper? The problem is these are observational data which basically have this problem of selection bias. Selection bias means that people that have the, the, the do the intervention, which eat lots of fruit and vegetables, have certain characteristics that are also colleagues of outcome interest living longer. What do we know about people who eat seven or more fruits and, fruits and vegetables a day? These are not normal people. Normal people don't do that. Okay? They, they spend all the time eating fruits and vegetables, going to the gym, working out, that sort of stuff. Okay? So, so they're very health conscious. And so seriously, and I'm one of them, so I do know. Okay? So seriously, people who are eating more fruit and vegetables are more educated, higher income, more health aware, all of which are correlated with eating more fruit and vegetables and living longer. So, there's a correlation there. There's no doubt there's a correlation there. But when there's a causal relationship between eating fruit and vegetables and living longer, you can't tell from those data. It may be true, but you cannot tell from those data. So we can't believe that. It may, it may be true, it may not be true. What about the five piece study? So again, we have a graph, same horizontal axis, fruit and vegetables eaten per day. Vertical axis is now still, it's an odds ratio, so it goes down. It's still death, it's still important death. So death, the risk of death goes down, more you eat, but it plateaus at five. So there's no benefit from eating more than five pieces a day. And where does this come from? Oops, whoops, whoops, where we go? Okay, these are data from 16 high quality studies in a systematic review. That's looked at the evidence base and said, where are the high quality studies? The ones that actually take account of these confounding factors like education and health behavior, and say, controlling for all those things, what is the impact of fruit and vegetables on death? And this is the conclusion they get. So we've got to decide which of these do we trust. We have more trust in this one. So we have to understand which of these pieces of evidence is more reliable than the other. So it's very important to know correlation is not causation. And systematic reviews who have claimed about the effectiveness, what effect does this have on that, only include studies that we can tell us about effectiveness. Um, and it's important to understand what is good quality evidence to answer a particular research question and what is not. Now, I'm, I fully believe there are different types of evidence for different questions, but for questions of effectiveness, you want to control for this selection bias problem. And it's important that us as policy advisors understand that. It'd be really nice if BBC journalists understood that too. So the, the headline, I'll go back, the headline here should have been really rubbish study funded by and published in the journal. <laughs> that, that, should, that should be the headline. Okay. Um, so let's give another example. This is the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the same as Campbell Works in Health, you're probably aware of it. And this is a, this bit of logo, it's a stylized representation of what's called a forest plot. Um, and a forest plot shows you basically what effect intervention has. 
the horizontal line is an individual study, so there's seven studies here, seven lines. The vertical line means that when the horizontal line crosses the vertical line, that study found no effect of the intervention on the outcome. And the intervention here is a corticosteroid injection given to a woman about to deliver prematurely, because premature babies are more likely to die. And so if this line lies to the left, that study found a significant impact on reducing risk of mortality from having the injection. If the line crosses the vertical line, that study found no effect. So if we were to look at this literature, so there are seven studies. Five of them found no effect of this injection, but two did find effect. Well, if you did what was called vote counting, you say, where's five out of two, you know, the intervention loses. We're not going to do the intervention. If you do meta-analysis, which is a statistical approach that we use and review to combine the different studies, to pull all the data together, so if we take average data, what the average effect is across all these studies, we actually find this, which is a 30 to 50% reduction in the risk of the baby dying when it's born prematurely. That's a very large effect. And the fact of this review, this review being done, has led to corticosteroid injection, which is very cheap, being carried out around the world in hospitals, but they being delivered prematurely. Um, and I'm going to this technical issue. Uh, whereas if we'd done vote counting, we'd have come to the wrong policy conclusion. Vote counting would literally kill babies in this case, because babies who are alive today, because of this injection being adopted, would have been dead had this policy not been followed based on vote counting. So it's really important to do these reviews correctly to understand what the evidence is really saying. Rigorous evidence, doing it right, really does matter. It's literally a matter of life and death. It's another example from international development, payment for environmental services. This is where you pay farmers not to cut down trees. We have a Campbell review of this. Um, only five studies. This, the forest plot again. And here's the, uh, the effect size estimate. And what we find here is it does actually, can't really see very well, it just falls to the right of the line, which shows there is reduced deforestation as a result of these programs. That's the outcome, reduced deforestation. But the effect is really small. This is what's called a standardized mean difference. And a small standardized mean difference is 0.2. And this is less than 0.005. Not 0.05, but 0.005. It's tiny. It's equivalent to a 0.3% reduction in deforestation. That means if you pay the farmers for 10 years, don't cut down your trees, 97% of those trees would not have been cut down without any payments. 97% of those trees would still been there if they hadn't paid anybody a cent. So that means these programs, though they work, they're not very cost effective. 97% of that money is effectively wasted, those trees will still be there anyway. So the conclusion of this review is, okay, they work, the effects are really small, they're not cost effective, so if you're going to do something like this, you need really to target it better, where they might have cut down those trees, or you need to find some other incentive mechanism that works more effectively. Um, and this effect is satisfied by the fact that these programs have large fixed costs, so the, the cost effectiveness is even lower. I presented this study in Norway. They like trees in Norway, they've got lots of them. And they said there's an EBBA study, it's a Swedish group, there's an EBBA study that shows that PES actually work. So back in the issue where we've got two studies of the same research question, how effective is PES, apparently giving contradictory results. So, as the chair of the session, who was the head of uh, climate change for Norwegian Development in Norad, says, what's a policymaker to do when we have two reviews on the same question giving conflicting answers? The answer is, both of these studies can't be right, let's look at them and, and see which one is right, because it comes down to being good quality evidence, right evidence, and wrong evidence. So, I looked at the PEST study, and it said they analysed 11 studies, more than half of which seven, judged PEST to be intervention. So 7 out of 11, so it seems to be successful. What's wrong with this picture? Not this picture, this, this result. Uh, the, what's wrong is they're doing vote counting. They say, oh, 7 out of 11, it works. They're not looking at the effect size. We didn't say it doesn't work. We said it's got a really, really small effect. So it works, but the effect's tiny. So they didn't look at how big the effect was. They can't say that. They didn't look at the quality of the studies. But notice they've got 11 studies, and we had five. Is that because they did a better search than us? No, it's because there weren't many studies. So they said, we're going to adopt generous screening criteria, which means they include before versus after studies, no comparison group. That's, not a, that's outcome monitoring. That's not a valid measure, measure of effects. So they included studies that we know are biased towards more likely to find a positive effect, but don't give a valid measure of effects. And so some of these seven, actually about half, four, four of the seven, actually are not valid measures of effects whatsoever anyway. 
And so it's invalid findings <coughs> from the, the level review. I say it's misleading, but actually it's simply, simply wrong. And it's very damaging when we have reviews out there done to low quality. And that's when I said they should be doing Campbell reviews. I meant it. So you do Campbell reviews, you have to do them to Campbell standards. You can punch them or not, I don't care. Well, I do care, but I mean, that, that's up to you. But you have to do them to proper standards for reviews. So this is why... I'll go and skip the lessons. There are lots of lessons, great. So the problem is we've done lots of reviews and now we want to get them used. Uh, a review like our, our review on deworming is 700 pages long. It's very unlikely that anyone, including even the author's mother, is going to read that. Yes? So we've got to find a way to get these reviews used in evidence. And policy makers are not going to read these long reviews. So wave four is knowledge brokering. Well, there's what we've seen in the last five years is this rise, this rise of knowledge brokering as a thing. We have organisations set up whose job is to get policy into practice and policy. So knowledge brokering becomes actually an activity in its own right. Um, so we have this project cycle, policy cycle, and the thing I want to focus on so I is this bit here. We want to take the evidence synthesis and use it to inform design and policy and programmes. There are two ways in which we can do this. This is the fourth way. Two ways to do it. Customised direct interaction and building knowledge broken platforms. And this is the thing I'm really excited about. This is fine, but this is what I'm excited about. So customised interaction, I call this the Nordic model. In Nordic countries, you have funded agencies like the Public Health Institute, where actually we have an office, where Trisha here is based, Viva in Copenhagen, SBU in Stockholm. These are government-funded research agencies, and the staff of those agencies, their job is to write systematic reviews for government. So they're not academic researchers, they don't publish in journals, they write some reviews for government agencies. So each year they have a, con a couple times a year, they have a consultation exercise with government departments, they agree the priorities, and then, they, then the staff go and write 10 reviews a year in social, in social welfare to inform government decisions around spending, guidelines, or whatever. Um, and just to give an example, they say that you have these in social welfare, health, and education in all three countries. So let's take the Knowledge Centre for Education in Norway, the minister said, I'm concerned about school dropouts, kids not completing school. And so they looked at the Campbell review on dropouts, they updated it. They said, there are seven things that seem to work in reducing school dropouts. There's two that seem like they're applicable in Norwegian context. Let's try those out here. And they're now doing randomised controlled trials, those programmes in Norway. Evidence-based policy, not a blueprint approach. You see what works elsewhere, then you try it out in the local context. And that's what's happening in this approach. So this is what I call customised direct interaction because the researchers talk to the policy makers, find out their evidence questions, do the research to inform the policy and help the, the policy makers understand the implications of that research for their policy. Which is great, but when you've got a national level decision making or a state level decision maker that you're working with. When you've got this centralised decision making down at district level in schools or by individual social workers or prison governors that are making decisions, there are tens of thousands of them. You can't do customised direct interaction with all of them. So what do we do? We need knowledge platforms that make the evidence available to them in ways they can use without having to actually talk directly to a researcher or read a research paper. So there are different ways of presenting bodies of evidence. The ones you're most familiar with are databases. So the Post Monarchus is a collection of impact studies and reviews in health. Um, Eric is a collection of education research. The 3 i database is a collection of international development impact evaluations and reviews. Um, and the thing about databases is it's better than searching Scholar Google. So I'm interested in agricultural extension in developing countries. I can search developing the GI database. I know the studies I'll find will be impact evaluations or reviews, because that's all it has. But if I search Scholar Google, I'll find four million studies, which could be anything. They're not the studies I want to be fixed. But that's all this has. So knowledge has been broken or curated, back to again what you said you do, um, to say it's just that evidence you wanted, well here it is in this database. The other thing we can do is structure the evidence using evidence maps, which is getting very popular. The comps we've had over the river here, um, some have said to be about maps, 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 maps become very popular. Maps structure the evidence with different interventions and outcomes, and that's okay for that intervention category, and those outcomes, what evidence is available, you can click down in the map and find the studies. The next level up, evidence, that goes far, evidence platforms. And as I'm going to explain, evidence platforms make the evidence available in a more heavily curated way. Next level up is guidelines, even more heavily curated. And then you have evidence checklists. So evidence-based checklists. 
So what you come to is this, what I call the knowledge-broken platform pyramid. Two left words in the top one. But, so this pyramid is based on the idea we have data and studies which are summarised in reviews, which go to databases and maps, and then you have these portal guidelines and, and checklists. And there's a critical break in this pyramid here. Because uh, below this level, they take the users back down to the studies. Above this level, the users are no longer required to read the academic research. You're telling the user informing decisions based on curated or broken evidence to say to inform decision making. Then the portal says, here's the evidence, you decide what to do. And evidence guidelines say, we've had some experts look at the evidence and we recommend this. Evidence-based checklists say, just do this, don't think about it. So the example I had on the previous slide was from Scotland NHS on how to allow to care home for people with dementia. You've got a care home for dementia, these are things you should do in the care home layout for those people to be better oriented and quality of life and so on. So this is curating the evidence in ways that make it accessible. And um, this happens best in health. So the World Health Organization publishes lots of guidelines, which are then used at national level by many countries. And this is a quote from the WHO guidelines on producing guidelines. And the guidelines on guidelines say that WHO guidelines have to be based on high quality systematic reviews. So we institutionalised the use of systematic reviews in informing <coughs> guideline development. We want to see that across all sectors. Um, what's happening in the UK is you have these What Works centres funded by government and the big lottery. They commission reviews, and the largest of them also commission primary studies. We have well-being, crime reduction, ageing. Um, we have local economic growth. And we have some regional ones like Scotland. And the biggest one is Education Down Foundation. And they've now funded, actually, these are out-of-date numbers, so as of a couple of years ago, they had funded over 500 randomised controlled trials in English, in English schools. If you've gone back 10 years, people would have said to you, oh, you can't do randomised controlled trials in education in England, it's decentralised at local government level, unions won't allow it. Over 500. There's now over a third of schools have been in, primary schools have been in RCTs, over a million children have been in RCTs in the English, English education system in the last five years. Okay, so a huge change. But the biggest change is the evidence portal, the teaching and learning toolkit. Let's see it. There's a, there's a version done here in Australia, I meant to have it up on the slides, but I forgot to put it in, which is done by, come on, give me the name. My school. No. No, you're getting it wrong. So they're <laughs> probably well known. It's, oh, edu I forget, it's education evidence, something. Anyway, okay. it's the same, it's, they have the same toolkit, but it's blue. So they've taken the year toolkit, I mean, with permission, uh, and they made it blue. So, so what the, the, the heart of the teaching and toolkit is, is, is this. They took 34 interventions, types of intervention, they commissioned reviews, seven reviews of these interventions, and they had to present the evidence, here it is, and ask participation, here's how much it will cost you, not literally two pounds, but on a scale of one to five pounds, five being more expensive. Here's how strong the evidence is, five lots, lots of RCTs, saying the same thing, one lot, no RCTs, just weak evidence. And then impact, having a student do an after participation program is equivalent to two months additional schooling. It's like they went to school for two additional months. So that's the impact. What's the amount of additional learning you get from being exposed to this program? You can sort by this, and you can see that feedback, giving the student feedback based on their work, is a very low cost, and it's like having an additional eight months schooling. Really high impact, very low cost. So this is great because you can see here's a very effective program, won't cost me much, and you can drill down, you can click on this and read more about what the intervention is, described the intervention. You can drill down if you want to and read, read the evidence synthesis, but you don't have to. You can just look at this. You can say, what else might I do? Well, I might have bad students repeat a year. That's going to cost me a lot of money, and then they're going to set them back by four months. It's a bad thing to do. Very clear, so let's stop doing that. Very clear evidence coming across from the evidence synthesis and moderate evidence. So a study came out by the UK National Audit Office in 2015 showed that 64% of English school managers are using this toolkit to allocate school level resources. 64% of school managers are using evidence of such reviews to allocate school resources. Because the knowledge broken platform doesn't require them to look for those reviews, read those reviews, they inform the decisions based on the evidence platform. So this has to be the future. We have to build the evidence architecture across all sectors. 
so social workers, prison governors, whoever works in different sectors, like homelessness, child abuse, whatever, will know which are the most effective programs. Because when we do reviews, when we do review studies, we find out that 80% of things do not work. Most program managers think our programs work, but we know they work. Well, actually, they just assume the absence of evidence that they don't work, because most things don't work. Only when you've got evidence to show they work, you really have to be confident that they do. So we need to start generating that evidence to find out about program effects. Here's another example. So this is something called MagiCap. So, so I, oh, here we go. I've gone down too many far. So MagiCap is for, for health, obviously. <coughs> and every time a new review comes out in Cochrane, the British Medical Journal publishes something called BMJ Rapid Rec. And the, um, the Rapid Rec gives a recommendation for against quick intervention. So this is prostate, uh, screening for prostate cancer. And the review came out fairly recently. It's a weak recommendation because the um, evidence isn't strong, but they're against it because they don't do it. This is the advice. You can drill down and get some different metrics. So here's the relevant metrics. For men who get prostate cancer screening, how many of them die after 10 years? If they didn't get screened, three per thousand die. If they did get screened, three per thousand die. There's no impact. But you do do the prostate cancer screening, and every thousand, 94 get blood in their semen, 67 get blood in their urine, 45 get pain, 19 will get fever, and one goes to hospital. Okay? Quite a lot of adverse side effects for no benefits. So is this a good thing to do or not? You decide it's a decision making tool. But here's what the evidence says. So the doctor can use this and discuss it with their patient. So there it is. We want you to become an evidence revolutionary today. You can start right now. There's lots of options to do this. I'm sorry I have to go to our board meeting immediately after we, we stop after the question and answers. Not now, it takes a bit longer. But you can go to our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. We have some information on the stand at the back um, by the sign-in table. And Jewish here from our office is here. And so she'll stick around a bit longer and happy to answer any questions. So, thank you. So, yes, to an extent. So, in the UK, the What Works movement is organised by uh, the Cabinet Office, and they have a committee, a council for What Works centres, and there's a recent review done, uh, it was actually being distributed at the conference by a guy called David Goff, uh, who works in the epicentre in London, who also works on reviews, and he reviewed the What Works centres in the UK, and sort of places different things they do. Um, and then David and I jointly are doing work on the evidence standards of the what works in the UK and the US and a couple other places. And that's, that's a really crucial decision. And it's a big distinction between the US platforms and the UK's platforms. So US, in the US, evidence-based policy is a big thing, but they do it wrong. So in the US, it's all about branded programs. So if you go, if you saw a digital ring toolkit, it has 34 different programs like feedback, participation, which are a generic description of programs. It's not a branded program. Anyone wants to do feedback. It's fine. Kind of so on. Whereas you go to the what was clearing house of education in the US, click on teaching, it's a list of 100 branded programs. So the evidence-based policy in the US is based on what branded programs have been proven to work. And the evidence stands are normally, there are two RCT shows with its effective. And that's a bad thing, because it doesn't even vote count, it's worse than vote counting, the data says, because it could be five shows, it's not effective, but you ignore that, you just say there's two shows effective, so it shows it works. And also said, once we've got to, we stop there. It's like NFP. We've got to, we can stop there. They don't think you need to keep building up body evidence. There's lots of research, lots of reasons to believe to show why when you roll out programs, you take evidence, the effects get smaller. And so you've just done one trial with high fidelity. That's not a good sign, a good indication of how effective it would be over, over time. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of interest now. There was a meeting in OECD last week on evidence standards, and we'll have one in London next month. So if people are now talking about this, evidence standards is a thing, to pay attention to, well, okay, we've got these platforms, how reliable are they? What, how, are they based, how are they basing what they tell us, what are the underlying sort of standards they use? And that's, that's important. So yeah, it is, people are concerned about it, and it, we need to be transparent in how we make our decisions and, and do it correctly. Excellent. Uh, 
another question at the back. Can maybe just say who you are when you ask the question as well, just to give a flavour of who's in the room. I'm just wondering if in your pyramid, we're talking about users <laughs> of the research um, below the line that use the evidence to make decisions. Is there any work being done about communities of practice? For example, I know in Canada, in the family violence field, they're using uh, communities of practice with practitioners mm -hmm. about how they're using evidence. Right. So, I'd say a couple of things about that. First one is, these are decision-making tools. And so, in the end, decisions are informed by multiple factors, some, some good, some bad. Uh, political considerations come in, but certainly values come in. So, um, uh, we're doing a lot of work, there's new what we're on homelessness in the UK, and we're working very closely with them. And regrettably, you'll see that homelessness is quite a big problem here in Melbourne, a lot of people sleeping rough. Um, the same is true in London. I live in Bonn, it's not a big problem, but they, they lock them up. So, so that wouldn't be acceptable in London, it probably wouldn't be acceptable here. And so they're different values. And so about how you approach a particular problem. Um, and I was doing a presentation yesterday uh, on a review I've done on what are called community-driven development programs. I think this, this is more relevant to you, so it's a question you're asking. So in community-driven development programs, they, they give money to community, a village in, a, in Africa, some, in a village in Africa somewhere. So, okay, you decide how to use money, decide to rehabilitate the school, build a health clinic, whatever, and then you implement that program. And these programs have gone for 20 years now, and over time there's been more and more external facilitation of the community process. And that's because as this program evolved, the donors supporting like the World Bank, the British government, have said, OK, it's great, but we want more involvement from women or people with disabilities. And if you rely on traditional structures to manage the programme, that doesn't happen. So there's a trade-off there between do we really let the community drive the programme or do we impose certain requirements like the community committee must have 50% women, which is an example of what gets done. So you know, there's a, that's a value judgment. Do, do we want to impose those values or do we want the community to use its own structures? And that's not an evidence based. So you can tell, I can tell what the evidence says about well, when you require female that's in the committees, what happens, because there have been experiments on that. But I can't tell you whether it's right to do that or not, because that's a value decision based on what the evidence says. And so, in the end, you need to get involved. That's why we have decision making tool on prostate cancer. It's not, well, don't do it. It's like, well, that's what the evidence says, you decide. And the, the, the second point would be, which is a bit different, there's a really nice presentation yesterday on. I forget what the word was that he used, but uh, basically for getting community design adaptation of local programs. And so you've got a basic concept, might be around parenting classes or something, but when you take it into a particular community, how you're going to design, it was actually, it wasn't parenting classes. So designing the curriculum for, for no, early, early years education, preschool education, designing the curriculum for preschool education, they want children you know, in, um, I forget which country it's in, but say in, in Senegal, not to learn you know, French history as they have done historically, but to learn about Senegalese history and learn about Senegalese plants and flora and stuff and learn about the history of, of, of their, their actual their people. And so they design and learn, and learn about traditional remedies. So they, learn, they, start, they design curricula locally. So the sort of basic idea of doing early education comes in as if something externally supported, but the curriculum gets determined locally based on local knowledge. And that's, that's entirely because it's an evidence-based approach. There's nothing to you know, stop that. Okay, brilliant. Right. Uh, aware that you have to dash off, Harry. Yeah, so thank you very oh, thank much. Thank you very much. Um,